here we are. Betsy was quite right. Today is going to be um, more pictorial, uh, more f conceptual. Uh, so I'm only going just to recap with only two slides, or th maybe three, um, from the end of last, uh, of Tuesday, just in case, you know, a lot may have happened to you since Tuesday, and you might have forgotten uh, everything that I said then, or nearly everything. So let's, let me just remind you of what the reaction is we're talking about, what the enzyme has to do. Um, is that, are the lights too high for you at the back? You can see this. Okay, it's just contrast question. So, um, you've seen this slide before. There we've got um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. And there's some idea that if you were a chemist and you just looked at this reaction, somehow we've got to get from here to there, from DHAP to glyceraldehyde phosphate. And as I said on Tuesday, well, it's perfectly logical to have a base, some kind of base, B, that pulled off that proton that, uh, and just did this enolization and perhaps has helped a bit with a, an, a general acid. And that if you just follow those curly arrows, you'd get this diol. And then if you were starting on the right and doing exactly the same pro chemical process, but of course now pulling off the enolizing enolyzable proton, that is that one, so the base sort of reaches over and pulls that one off, and the arrows go the other way, uh, you get to the same thing. So that, that, there is the mechanism, if you will, but only from the brain of a physical organic chemist. We don't know anything about what nature does yet, uh, but that would be reasonable. Uh, I should have mentioned on Tuesday, the fact that there's all this, remember, exchange with the solvent and so on, tells you that H, the H's that are moving around the place, because I'm breaking that CH bond and I'm making that CH <coughs> bond, that what we're dealing with is protons. After all, if you have hydrogen, you could transfer hydrogen in three ways. You could transfer it as a proton, you could transfer it as a hydride ion, or you could transfer it as a hydrogen atom. Now, you'd need, of course, an electron here, and you'd need a couple of electrons there to balance it all off. But um, never mind about those. You could, in principle, if you, if you want to be a bit compulsive about this, you could say, well, I mean, how do we know? Well, we know because of this exchange with the solvent, we know it's that, because protons, as you well know, you make OH, H2O, you make OH minus. But you, you don't take H2O and pull a hydrogen hydride ion off it and make OH plus. You don't do that. So, and, and we don't break, there's no evidence for free radicals. And so this is, becomes a, a very reasonable mechanism for uh, a physical, any physical organic chemist. Now, at the end of Tuesday, um, we decided that we'd arrived there. That this here were all of the rate constants for that four-step reaction, so that the, the substrate bound to the enzyme to make the enzyme substrate complex. Then the B minus pulled the proton off um, to get the ene diol. You remember these were in basically in equilibrium with one another on Tuesday I called that A and B, and I, on, and I called that, well, C and D, and then the product falls off the enzyme and the, the left to right reaction is over. And I remember I said to you that there were really three things about this profile that really immediately hit one between the eyes. The first was that this distance, this rate constant, 4 times 10 to the 8, which is, of course, from if I'm going right to left, if I'm going in the downhill direction, from the starting state to the highest transition state, that's, the, that's what it's got to overcome. So that's the, rate con the second order rate constant for the reaction as a whole. Because once I've got to that energy, it's all downhill from there. It just tinkles along. 
and that that, this is the first point, is the same rate as a diffusion pr controlled process. That there's simply the rate at which E finds GAP in solution. They're both swimming about, sorry, they're swimming is too um, active a verb. Um, they're both being battered about and diffusing randomly, right? Ra totally randomly, the enzyme rather more slowly, and GAP being a little molecule, um, being battered about and so on. And the rate at which two molecules find each other uh, is this, so that it couldn't, you remember, uh, that that's as fast as it could be. The second point I wanted to make about this, I made on Tuesday, was that that, the highest hump, is, a, is higher than, just higher than all other bumps. And that, that is to say, this one, which is the nearest, is only, is a bit lower than this one, but not dramatically lower. And finally, there is nothing, uh, the, the product, the, the lowest free energy condition of enzyme plus dihydroxyacetone phosphate, none of these are below that. So there's a dotted line here, if you will, below which there are no states. Yes? How come if you're going from left to right, that first hump isn't like the same as the diffusion rate constant? Very good question. <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> that it isn't. Um, we we um, when something <coughs> I drew, we drew it like this to be conservative. It probably is, but we couldn't measure it because it's not rate limiting. It, I, we can't see it. So you might have said, well, look, if you're going to say that's diffusion control, why don't you put, make that one diffusion controlled? And I could have, because to be honest, that should probably be a dashed line. I don't really know. We don't really know because we've got no way of finding out. It's it's. Um, you know, once you've got over here, it's all over. And if I go from left to right, that's so much lower than that. Th that is so much lower than that by, by, I'm eyeballing it now, that's probably nearly a factor of 10 as drawn, um, that it, it, do it doesn't become, in the trade we say, kinetically significant. You can't ever get at it. So to be proper, and one of my slides on Tuesday should have, I think I did, did have that, that there's doubt about that and there's actually some doubt about the precise height of that. But you're, you're asking a very good question. The things that are really firm are here, there, 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 and uh, the, uh, those. Um, because th the, all of those things are uh, detectably significant. But you ask, you, I'm glad he's, he's you, you, you see the, the problem. It ought to be, I mean, on, diffusion ought to be the same, of course, and will be uh, uh, for such similar molecules as the sub, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde phosphate. So that was what we thought, and you saw this final slide from Tuesday, that what, to get to this position where in the downhill direction, that is here from right to left, the thermodynamically downhill direction, um, we have um, the second order rate constant is the same as the diffusion rate constant. All the humps are below that line. All the valleys are above that. that that's what the last four billion years has done for us. And I claimed to you then <coughs> the enzyme is perfect. It couldn't get any better. Um, and we better be quite interested in w how on earth this catalyst is doing all this. I didn't tell you one other thing on Tuesday, which I'd like to tell you now. Um, but I mentioned it obliquely. We know the stereochemistry of that chiral center. That is, of course, that's got four, di that's a carbon atom with four different groups attached to it. So that's D-glyceraldehyde phosphate, or in the more appropriate and modern nomenclature, R-glyceraldehyde phosphate. How many of you have done, are you all happy with stereochemistry? You know, you've done R and S, and you know about 
relative and absolute configuration, I'm seeing enough nods to be perfectly happy. <laughs> so I've drawn there R glyceraldehyde phosphate. That's the, the configuration of that molecule. Remember, we also, I didn't tell you how it was done, and I won't, but um, we know that the proton, that is a prochiral center. It's got two, hyd two different, uh, two hydrogens attached. So that's not, uh, that doesn't make it uh, R or S, unless I make one of the, I make a difference between those H's. Well, when you put in deuterium, for example, that, of course, makes it immediately a chiral center. So, and we know that the, it's that proton that's pulled off and not that one. That's the pro-R proton and that's the pro-S proton. And we know it's the pro-R proton. <coughs> and so, and that's what I've drawn there. And now you can see with one more piece of information, which you also know from Tuesday, that there is a bit it's about 5%. If I make that a tritium label, uh, about 5% of it uh, <coughs> gets through. Lots of it washes out, of course, here. But about 5%, if that's deuterium, 5% of that is deuterium. That means, you know, that it's quite likely that it's, there's only one base, right? That the base, this B, that pulls this off is the same base that delivers that hydrogen back. Now, if you're going to have one base, and if you're going to draw it all as I've drawn it, what that means is that the ene diol, as I have drawn it here, is cis, with the OHs on the same side. It could, of course, have been a trans ene diol, in principle. But I'm just wanting uh, to take two minutes to stress to you how you know, you, you get more structural information by just examining all of these little details so that you know what to build into the X-ray crystal model, what, to, what you're dealing with. And we, we do know that the configuration of that indial is a cis with the OHs <coughs> on the same side of the double bond, uh, not on opposite sides. End of digression. And now let's say, let's put, crystallize the enzyme and put it in an X-ray beam. But before we do that, let's understand how the information <coughs> from an isomerase is probably going to be better than the information you get from nearly any other kind of enzyme. Take, for example, an <coughs> enzyme, a very early one, lots of the early enzymes in the 60s that had, and 70s, that had the crystal structures determined were, of course, small ones, because <laughs> it was sort of easier for the crystallographers. <coughs> but um, they were hydrolytic enzymes. So they, w they took a peptide and chopped it in half. <coughs> that means they took a substrate and made two products. Now, many of you will know, I hope all of you, that a protein crystal is largely not protein at all. It's water. Um, that is, it's, these are very wet. That's why they're so, one reason why they're so fragile. But 40 to 60 percent of a protein crystal is actually water. And it's got great channels. These protein molecules, I mean, I'm not going to successfully to draw, but you know, you, well, I'll, I've got on the next slide. It's easy enough to show, easier to show you there. Uh, well, where is it? It isn't. There we are. Um, it's. <coughs> A protein crystal, it, it, let's assume that the enzyme is spherical, and let's assume that that little um, lemon leaf shaped thing is um, uh, the active site. <coughs> now, in a crystal, because there are channels between the, the enzyme molecules, channels of water, if you soak the crystal in substrate, it can diffuse in, and the, and the enzyme, many, 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 I might say mostly, <coughs> enzymes in the crystal form are, are active. They're, they're perfectly proper active enzymes. So what a, a substrate will, you know, will find its way into that active site and the enzyme will hydrolyze it. If this was a, a hydrolytic enzyme, uh, chopping S into two products, P1 and P2, and so 
Once it's hydrolyzed, of course, the P1 will diffuse out, and P2 may diffuse somewhere else. And if I were to take, in this top case, a, if I were to take the crystal and soak it with S, what am I going to see at the active site? <coughs> Probably nothing much, because um, the enzyme is busy, and there'll be, for a fleeting moment, there'll be bits of, uh, and there'll all be different moments. Um, the, this enzyme over here will have a substrate, but it's, it'll have hydrolyzed it, and so I'll see a slight mess of substrates diffusing in and products diffusing out, and it'll just all be rather fuzzy. And that is what happens. It doesn't help with enzymes of that form doing that kind of thing, if you will, to so it doesn't help much. What you've got to do, if you want to study these enzymes, is not to add a substrate, but to add an inhibitor, something that goes in there and is concrete, I mean, is, is, won't, can't be broken for some reason. And now think of that conceptually. I'm going to take my, my enzyme, I'm going to take it, find its crystal structure, then I'm going to flow in an inhibitor, and then I've now got an inhibitor, yes, now, this time, bound at the active site. And I'm now going to have to try and figure out from what axiomatically doesn't work, namely an inhibitor, how the enzyme really would work had it only been a substrate. You see the conceptual problem here? That the only thing you can study in a case like that is something that doesn't work. Because if it does work, it's all over and I've just got a mess and the, the, the uh, channels between the protein molecules are filled with either substrate or P1 or P2 or whatever. Whereas, look at this, the loveliness of the bottom part of this slide. If it's an isomerase, <coughs> I can only go from S to P, or P back to S. So now I diffuse in this substrate. It doesn't matter whether I diffuse in S or P. It'll go in there. OK, the enzyme S diffuses in, but it's now P. But P is a substrate for the back reaction, so it's now S again. All right, well, it's P again. And so on. what I'm saying is here now is a productive, is the real thing, and what I will see is, of course, which, whichever, I, I, I can't see, if, if substrate, if S is of lower free energy than P, then I will see S. If, uh, sorry, strictly, if the ES complex, let me do a simple one like that. If, if that was EP and that's ES, and I purposely made that a bit lower than that, then, of course, what I will see in the crystal is that. Whereas, if the enzyme, if the profile were a little bit different from that, then of course <coughs> what I would see, because I'm adding lots of substrate, so I'm really only looking at this part, I would see ES rather than EP. I'm only going to look at that part. Okay? That's the advantage and the, the difference of uh, a of, an iso of a crystal structure of an isomerase. And that is what you see, except you can't see it. Um, do we? Uh, this is, do, uh, I hope the color slides won't be as, quite as bad as that. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, this is an old, uh, from before you were born, the, the crystal structure. I mean, not quite. Well, no, it was. Um, this is 78. Um, 19, I mean, early, a very early crystal structure. And the blue are just chains, of boring chains, uh, uh, main chains. Here is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. There's P, O, O, O. There is the carbonyl group. And there's the OH group. And here is a lysine sitting there. Here is a glutamic acid. That's a COO minus, <coughs> COO minus there. And there is a histidine. That's what just, that's all you saw. Not terribly informative, um, uh, but at least we had an active site um, and you, w we <coughs> built into it. This was determined by uh, David Phillips in Oxford and then later by Greg Petsko uh, uh, following it up at Brandeis. Uh, 
um, and one could build in the substrate, one could see the substrate in the active site. Um, but, you know, at that level, it's not really telling us much, is it? So let's, let's um, go, let's zoom in a bit. And actually, <coughs> before we do that, I want to ask if, I want to say, if you were um, God, nature, take what identity you wish, but um, if you were designing triosphosphate isomerase, what would, you, what would you say you would like to have? Well, I submit to you that what you'd like is three things. You'd like to hold on, you'd like to hold on to the substrate. You better bind it first. Well, you've got a lovely handle here with a phosphate group. Everything's got a phosphate group. The product and the substrate have both got phosphate groups, so it doesn't matter. Let's, let's use that to hold on tight. Uh, you'd like a base, as we've seen, and you'd like an acid. And what I want to do is just to look at those three, what, what we think we might um, understand, uh, of what, how the enzyme holds on, whether, what kind of a base it uses, and what kind of an acid. Well, when you look at the active site, when you look at the crystal structure, there's the substrate, there's that acid, gl glutamic acid, and there's um, histidine, the imidazole ring of histidine. But I'm talking about what holds on to that phosphate, P-O-O-O. And you, what you see is a great alpha helix. Now, how many of you are, have done enough protein structure to have heard of alpha helices? Alpha, all, all of you? Well, those of you who haven't, I'm going to show you in a second. But um, this is one of the determined by, of course, very early by Pauling in the 50s, uh, one of the motifs of uh, proteins. And it was very interesting to see this um, helix uh, coming up from the bottom of the molecule uh, and looking, apparently, at the phosphate. And when one thinks about that, uh, Pauling didn't quite suggest this, but if you do have a helix roughly um, depicted like this, there are, why does it form? It forms because of um, hydrogen bonds between the carbonyl of amide groups and the NHs of amide groups. But, and because it's a continuous helix, at the ends of the helix, we've got spare, at the right hand end, if you will, we've got spare carbonyl groups with no NHs to sort of match them with. And at the other end, of course, we've got <coughs> spare, excuse me, <coughs> um, NH groups with no carbonyls. And effectively what happens is you've got a dipole. So you've got a plus, spare plus charge at one end, at the end, the nitrogen end of the helix, and spare negative charge, <coughs> knowing as you do that this, of course, is a polar, polar group, on the oxygens. So this is a dipole. <coughs> now, it doesn't, you won't now be surprised when I tell you that it's the plus end of the dipole, of the helix that I just showed you, that is pointing at phosphate. And phosphate, after all, is P-O-O-O with two negative charges on it. That's quite smart of the enzyme, perhaps, to have that uh, pointing at it. And just look how exquisite. Now I'm looking down the barrel, if you will, of the helix. Just the computer can do that easily. And look how absolutely how extraordinarily precise it is. <coughs> that if you look down that barrel, it really is exquisitely aimed at, oh, 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 at, the, th at the three negative charges uh, of the phosphate. When, when we saw that, I, I mean, I was, uh, you can imagine, deeply happy. Um, the imagine, the, because of the precision of this, <coughs> that, that when I looked down the barrel, I, it was aiming at my phosphate. Um, and then, of course, if you then, there's more to it than that, and this is what more there is. Here is the helix coming up uh, with its, its nitrogen, the nitrogens, um, actually from gl glycine, uh, a couple of adjacent glycines, hydrogen bonding, I mean, never mind the whole dipole, uh, so that there's, 
plusness about all this end, but there are some explicit hydrogen bonds here. And this fellow, the third oxygen of the phosphate, isn't left out in the cold. It's got a couple of hydrogen bonds from NH, peptide NHs from a serine and a glycine. And notice how these are all in very different, I mean, those are adjacent, that's 232 and 233. The, the protein has about 250 amino acids in all. But this glycine is 171, and that serine is 211. But you can see how what we have here are four hydrogen bonds and the end of a helix dipole. And that, I would like to suggest to you, that's very comforting. OK, this thing has really got a hold um, of, of <coughs> the phosphate. We call it the phosphate gripper. Uh, to to, because the motif uh, of a dipole and, uh, a, and glycines, particularly using their NHs, that motif is quite common in RAS, the, one of the proteins that uh, associated with cancer, tumor formation, with phosphate binding proteins, with kinases. It's a common motif for any enzyme handling phosphate things, phosphate substrates. And so this was a great pleasure to see just um, how when it, the enzyme wanted to get a grip of a phosphate, it apparently could. Let's go to the second question. We've done that one. What's B? What do we think the base is? Well, look again at the crystal structure. And here's the substrate. But now I've surrounded it. Uh, I've put in these net uh, van der Waals um, b uh, boundaries, <coughs> which uh, show you, here's in yellow, the uh, CH2, CH2, COO minus. There's the glutamic acid. And there's the substrate. And look at this. Look how, how very snug it is. So that's, there, are, there are four points I want to make about this uh, glutamic <coughs> acid. And the first one is, you know, uh, just, just as the helix for a moment ago down here was aimed so exquisitely, this, gosh, there, there's no room. There's no slopping about here. Um, it's a very, you, I hope you would agree, that's a very snug fit. If I want to pull a proton, that's a carbon atom, there's OH. So the proton I want to pull off is about there. Um, for dihydroxyacetyl phosphate. And if it was glyceraldehyde phosphate, the proton would be about there. So it really is very nice and snug. That's the first thing. But there are three more interesting features that we might begin to be interested in. Um, and there's one of them. Remember, if you're, if you're designing triosphosphate isomerase, you want you don't know, if you're a TIM molecule, whether DHAP will swim into your active site, in which case uh, you want to pull that, the pro that proton off, DHAP, off, ca off carbon-3. But GAP might swim into your, uh, you don't know, into your active site, in which case, this is GAP on the, on the right, in which case you want to pull off this hydrogen off carbon-2. You don't know. Isn't it clever that to have not a base with one basic site, like an amine, <coughs> like an, uh, say NH2, which, where if you had an amine and you'd have to move it so that it could, uh, if DHAP came in, you'd want to, it to be pull off the proton here. But if GAP came in, you'd want it to pull off the proton here. If you use an acid, of course, you've got half a negative charge on either of uh, these oxygens. It doesn't really matter. You don't have to move this. You can use that <coughs> oxygen to pull the proton off if it's dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Or if it's glyceraldehyde phosphate, use the other oxygen. And you've just got half, half a negative charge on each. At least, look, I, don't, I can't prove that's why nature put glutamic acid there. But it's awfully seductive, isn't it, to, to the idea that uh, you don't have to move anything. You've, 
uh, you don't have to move the base. You've just got a bit of base, half a base, as it were, in exactly the right place, whichever substrate comes in. Um, so the proper description, of course, is that you've got a bidentate base, and that that is very attractive. That's attractiveness number two. Attractiveness number three is a little more arcane, and I don't expect you necessarily to have heard about uh, Professor Gandor, who many years ago, some years ago, said, and you can, you know, when you look at the orbitals, of course, you, I mean, you do know this, that you have two lone pair orbitals in an oxygen like that. One that is, for obvious reasons, called the sin lone pair orbital, and the other one, the anti, because it's away from the other oxygen. All right? And what, theoretically, Gandor said, I mean, from, from uh, um, <coughs> theoretical chemistry, not from experiments, um, he said that sin is much stronger base than anti. So if I'm going to use a carboxyl group to, as a base, I should pull the proton, I should by several orders of magnitude, but I'm stressed I didn't put them on the slide because it's um, theory, it's not experiment. But, you know, theory, computation, I mean, these chaps, they're very clever. Um, so I don't want to prejudice you, um, but th there, there was good suggestion that uh, sin orbitals are more basic, a stronger <laughs> base, if you will, so that if I'm going to use um, a carboxyl, let me use the sin orbitals. Well, of course, in all the pictures you've seen, uh, that's exactly what is being done. Where, where you, where, this is how the picture looks using this sin orbital. It doesn't look like that. The carboxyl group isn't coming in sort of and just using an anti-orbital uh, off its left-hand side. I mean, here, that's not what we've got. We have what's on the left. So that's the third feature that, you know, if you, again, if you were designing this, as a, as a wise physical organic chemist, I'll stop pretending that you're God, um, but if you were designing your Tim, you might say, oh good, yes, I must do that. I must have it like this and not like that. And then finally, um, in about the 50s, um, uh, Professor E.J. Corey, a colleague of mine at Harvard, uh, and his collaborator Sneen, showed that when you enolize, and this goes for acetone or acetaldehyde or any, when you want to make an enol, you, the orbitals, the, the, you want to pull, I'm sorry, you want to, this bond to be orthogonal to the, at right angles to the orbitals of the carbonyl group. Because in fact, as you pull, it's much easier to pull this way because the electrons in this orbital are then overlapping with the pi orbital up here, uh, above and below, of the carbonyl group. And it's much easier to pull a proton off at right angles there than it is to try and pull it off in the plane of the carbonyl group, if you want to analyze. And that's uh, a fact of um, um, up to several orders of magnitude. Well, what have we just seen? I didn't show you again. We've <coughs> seen this is exactly that. So it satisfies the stereoelectronic uh, rules, if you will, of Corey, um, which are seen all over the natural product world and, and elsewhere. And this is a, a clear, experimentally verified fact. So it's very, for, for, for those four reasons, I hope you're happy that nature provided, used a carboxyl group, carboxylate, strictly negative charge, um, as the base. All right. So we're happy about B. I hope we're happy about phosphate. We're happy about B. Uh, let's see about the third question, the acid, the general acid, to, uh, because it, you know, you don't, if you, if you didn't, ha if you imagine a, a mechanism without that, you don't really just want to pull that hydrogen off and then have the negative charge sitting there uncomfortably, do you? you you'd, like, you'd like a proton source here just to move your curly arrows um, and, and to have a longer 
um, and to neutralize, not to have charge accumulation, essentially. Um, and so if you look at the active site, this is a bit easier to see, but it's the black and white sliders you've seen before. There is histidine. Now, not all of you may know, may have in your minds, would they, Betsy, uh, the, the, um, what histidine is? Um, histidine is an amino acid and um, CH2 and so on, but with an imidazole side chain. And of course, that you can, uh, n uh, that has a pKa <coughs> about seven, about seven, uh, and uh, that is to say, it can pick up a proton. And so I can, uh, at lower pH. Um, so, you know, at about seven, that can be either a base um, or that could be an acid. Okay? Uh, that's just, I, I, I didn't want you to be bemused by uh, what that five membered ring was. It's that five membered ring with two nitrogens in it. That looks reasonable, um, I, I, you, you might think. And so let's look at the structure. Um, well, no, before, I'm so sorry. Before we look at the structure, let's, what, let's see what, what we'd like. We, we're happy with glutamate. And as chemists, I, you'd agree, I think, certainly this was us, our view, that we'd like imidazolium, that is positively charged. That's more of a proton giver, isn't it? Uh, that would be a better acid, if you will, um, to because uh, its pKa is about seven, and that would give a nice. And that would, um, when you just move the curly arrows, that would you get neutral imidazole, uh, the carboxyl group, and the enediol. We've got to be honest and say, but you know, the enzyme might. I mean, maybe it's got some surprises. Who knows? So m maybe it could use that uh, as, a, as an acid. Um, and that would go then, now I, I left the negative charge here, but of course, I, uh, if I, there's another pKa, I can ionize, this of course can ionize with a pKa of perhaps about 14 uh, to give you, to pull that proton off. <coughs> And now I've got the, imidazol the imidazolate or imidazolide, um, depending on who you like to talk to. Um, and that's, but you see, I've got to get up to pH 14 if I want to pull that proton off. So that's, that's a very weak acid, but that's a nice looking one. So um, uh, obviously, chemists prefer to use imidazolium um, rather than uh, to use imidazole and go to what could be a negative charge if I moved that over. So what does it look like? Well, there's the active site histidine, 95, and there's another alpha helix pointing at it. And it isn't just pointing at it. Look at that. If you look down the barrel of that alpha helix, there aren't that many alpha helices in well, there are eight in all, I think, but um, in Tim. But, um, you know, we use two of them, apparently. Um, just, and that, that aim you may not think is perfect, but never mind, it's jolly close. That really was Im is impressive. Um, well, that's, that's interesting. Why? I mean, maybe accident? Maybe that's just happened, a chance? Or do you think it might have some... Uh, some meaning. Um, well, now we've got, having seen that and seen which way around it is, which is shown on this slide at the bottom, I have to be more careful about what I said on the board over there. In favor of imidazolium is, as I just said, it's reasonable. The pK is about seven. Surely that's a better acid than having a pK of 14. On the other hand, uh, when you look at the crystal structure, and I hadn't told you this before, histidine 95 
actually is being hydrogen bonded to a peptide, to a, uh, the peptide backbone. And so it wouldn't be possible to have that as imidazolium. You, I'd have to put another proton in there. That's a bit worrying. And moreover, there's this dipole I just showed you. And, surprise, surprise, the positive end of it is sitting beside imidazole, so that wouldn't want to be plus either. I mean, that, that, that would discourage this from being positive, so that is to say it would lower the pKa down from 7 to, I don't know, I mean, 5, 4. So it would become a strong, that would become a stronger acid, but of course the two pKa's would come down together, so the 14 would start coming down to 12, 11. So anyway, w w seeing this, we realized we don't know the answer. So how do you think, just while I'm talking, think through in your mind, what, if you wanted to know, is it imidazole or is it imidazoleum? Is it positively charged or not? What's at the active site? Is it that or is it that? How could you tell whether it's that or that? I can't see protons, individual. I can't say, can I see that? No, I need to know how, um, I need to understand how I might get at uh, which of those it is, because I'd like to know. Well, there's the answer. N15 NMR. See, NMR, if I could put nitrogen 15 into the active site histidine and then take a spectrum, that could tell me. But the trouble is there are three histidines in the molecule, um, and we only want to know about one of them, as it says there. Uh, and there they are. There's 95, the one in the middle that we know about, and there's 103 and 185, but I don't want, I'm not interested in those. And so what we decided to do was to say, well, let's, let's assume there that nature isn't interested either. Let's mutate them. Let's change them to something innocuous. In fact, we used glutamine, which is about the same size, roughly. So we did a site-directed mutagenesis, the concept of which I'm sure you're familiar with. You can change an amino acid, if you're careful, um, uh, to another one. So we, what we did, in fact, was to take that enzyme and make it into that enzyme. And now we've only got one. Uh, we've histidine in the whole molecule, and of course, by changing histidine 103 to glutamine and 185 to glutamine, we then isolated this enzyme, showed it was fully active. It, didn't, it indeed didn't care about that one and that one. Um, they were just there for lettuce. I mean, they were for structural purposes, and we satisfied those with glutamine. So now we had one, and now we can add N15, Histidine, grow the um, uh, culture up on N15 histidine. So I've now put into the whole of Tim, I've just put two extra neutrons. I've just changed two atoms in the whole of the enzyme, uh, making each of those N15. And before I, and you can look at these, uh, and these two. And so if each, if, if each of these is N15, what would you expect in the NMR? Well, if it was not in an enzyme, you'd expect, wouldn't you, two peaks, if this was free solution, you'd expect one peak, because of course it's or almost, they might resolve, they might notice the difference here, um, but basically this would be one peak, because they're both NH positive, the, the, these nitrogens. These, however, are different. This has got a hydrogen attached to it. And, and this is a tertiary hydrogen. So uh, as part of the aromatic, aromatic ring of imidazolium. So this would, would give you two peaks. And this would give you one peak, you'd expect. So we took the NMR. And what do you have? You've got two peaks, very clearly. And so you start changing the pH to say, well, what's the pKa of this histidine? Because I can now do a titration. 
And the fact is, I can't do a titration because as far we went from pH 10 uh, to pH 5, uh, you know, beyond that, the enzyme denatures and falls to pieces. Um, it doesn't like very acid or very basic conditions. But we see no, no change at all. So that means that the pKa over on the board there that was 7, what we've got is two peaks, so it's that. And it's not, I'm even at pH 5, I'm not beginning even to protonate it. So the pKa isn't 7, it's down probably below 4.5. So, and that fits with the alpha helices, it fits with the hydrogen bond pattern at the active site. We're going to have to ask why in a minute, and I'm not going to be able to tell you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'll give you a guess, but I'm, I don't know. Um, so here was, uh, and here are the actual uh, PPM. What we expect here, as I was saying on the board, two, we expect two resonances, and that's where they are in for small molecules. And you can see what we observe with the enzyme isn't, it's pretty close. That in the in environment of the enzyme, uh, it's got all alpha helices and all these other things. But they're, so then they're perturbed a bit, but not too much. Whereas we would expect from model systems one peak at uh, about 200 ppm from nitric acid um, uh, if it was emitted as oleum. So there's no doubt about the the uh, explanation about the um, there's no doubt about the ionization state. So we've got to conclude that it's not imidazolium in neutrality where the timid enzyme is active. The enzyme, its pK has gone, is less than four and a half, I say probably because of the helix type, because of its environment. And so, sadly, chemists' preference is wrong. That's not true. This is correct. This is what the enzyme does. And can I explain it? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, except, except that the best thought so far that I think I have heard anybody put forward is that is here you would like, if you look at this, that is an ene diol. But actually, as drawn, it's the ene dialate, right? It's, it's ionized. And that has a pKa. And you can, you can, the ene diol has a pKa acting as a, an acid. And that pKa is probably, you have to estimate, uh, um, is probably around 10, 11. Well, maybe there is something, because the pKa of this is probably around 10, 11. Why do I say that? Well, as I alluded to earlier, if you're going to perturb this system, as we have done, and move that down to less than four and a half, that's at least two and a half units, then you're moving this one down in parallel, and that's going to be less than 11 or something like that. Um, 11 and a half, strictly. But, um, so they're all coming down together. And so the fact that we now know that the enzyme is not interested in that, and we're, we're, we're in this reg region, and the fact that the pKa here looks to be about 11, and that the pKa of that of the indiol, actually that with the proton on it, of this species is about 11, maybe there's something about that if you have matched pKa's, so the, the, the proton gets transferred fast, fastest. Sorry, I sh shouldn't say maybe. We know if there are matched pKa's, there'll be very facile proton transfer um, between uh, the same uh, 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 acids of the same pKa. <coughs> That's the best, I'm afraid, the best explanation I can give you for what, as you can see from my tone, um, uh, was a bit of a surprise. Uh, the enzyme has told us, is trying to tell us something, and obviously, um, uh, is not following, is not behaving uh, like a respectable physical organic chemist um, uh, that it, we, we thought it should be. However, uh, I'm not quite finished because 
you may think that, well, he's done the acid and he's done the base and that's all very nice and he's got the whole of it. But there's another, there's one um, more problem. Uh, but before I tell you about that, you can see another seductive possibility that you might, but I'm, I must caution you, but it's very seductive. Um, isn't it, you see, in a, I, this, you can imagine um, how one might think, look, um, how does that hydrogen, 5% of the time, get to transfer to the product? Well, maybe it gets pulled off, and then there's just a rotation of the carboxyl group, and it gets put back on the next carbon. So if you've got a bidentate base, you can account for a little bit of transfer just by spinning about that bond. And this is a seductive and slide with almost no evidence uh, for it at all. But isn't it interesting that imidazole has got two nitrogens? Uh, uh, because there might be, not that we could ever measure it, because these, of course, are very fast exchanging positions, but might it be that by rotation about that bond, you could act as a general acid and spin around and use that nitrogen there, um, and so on? Would it, wouldn't it be engaging? if you could spin round, and, and the, really what, what the enzyme was doing was just having, um, facilitating its proton transfers um, uh, by two bidentate <laughs> situations. I don't know. Uh, let me uh, stop being speculative and move on to a more serious final problem. And that is throughput. Now, what do I mean by throughput? I mean that this stuff, that you've been seeing so much of, the enediol, is actually a very unstable molecule, chemically. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate, that's all right. It sits around in buffer in the, uh, you know, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to keep it at room temperature for months, but um, in our bodies and other places, it's been turned over and stuff, and it keeps in the fridge for a, for a very long time. And the same is true of glyceraldehyde phosphate, but this stuff, is unstable. And if it were to fall off the enzyme, that it has fallen off, and uh, I'm so sorry, there seems to be a hydroxyl group uh, has also fallen off, but <laughs> never mind. Um, uh, it's not important, um, that one, as it happens. Um, but it can decompose, just according to these curly arrows. Phosphate can be lost, PI, and that stuff then tautomerizes to become a nasty molecule, methyl glyoxal, that, um, uh, oh. bless you, um, that stuff, uh, which is actually toxic uh, and very nasty, you don't want any of it anyway, but even if it wasn't toxic, um, if that intermediate falls off, it decomposes very rapidly, indeed, to, uh, and you've lost, you know, uh, the product forever. Uh, you will notice the more perceptive of you that I have changed the stereochemistry. This is all basically um, flat, but what I've now done is to twist about that bond so that uh, uh, stereoelectronically, sorry, yeah, stereoelectronically, I can um, have the orbitals uh, appropriately aligned so that these curly arrows, so I can eliminate phosphate. It doesn't eliminate, this material will not eliminate phosphate when it's on, if it's, if all of this is relatively planar. But once, once that bond rotates and I can, in order, for me to break this, as shown in the bottom of the slide, it happens. And of course, if, the, if it falls off the enzyme, everything's freely rotating, and the elimination, the internal elimination reaction can occur. So how does the enzyme stop that? Well, look at this. On the left is the enzyme. Uh, sorry, I should start on the right. On the right uh, is the enzyme as you do it without any substrate or anything bound to it. Uh, and uh, you see a conformation. Uh, and so I've only built that 
in into the model in the place I know it will bind, but on the right is the native enzyme with nothing bound to it. And you can see that there's a great lot of residues colored in lighter blue um, uh, that are in that, in that position. Whereas when I add substrate to the enzyme and now determine the crystal structure, these, that's where the residues are. You can hardly see the substrate. Uh, if you're a water model, if you're outside. So there's a great lid that comes down when the substrate is and, 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 and sequesters the substrate. <coughs> and because of these two crystal structures, there was a proposal, well, maybe there is a lid. Maybe there's a sort of, um, that maybe the black box has a lid. It takes in the substrate and does its thing and only lets it go when it's all over. Well, here's another picture of that loop. Um, in the closed form, so here's the substrate, and here just is the main chain tracing of a loop from about residue 166 to 176. It's about 10 amino acids, this uh, bit. And we noticed that if the, there are four amino acids here, this isn't very far from there, and maybe we could just delete those four amino acids, sew that up, and see what happened. So let's make the lid smaller. It shouldn't affect the structure, but it would certainly um, prevent there being a functioning lid. Uh, there you are is the actual sequence, and there are the, it's about 166 to maybe 100 beyond 160, 76. Uh, but here are those four amino acids, which you could just delete, join that alanine to that lysine, and have an enzyme. Well, uh, there is the um, modeled um, uh, open and closed, that's the best you can do, uh, uh, of what, uh, the reason it's in, in uh, quotes is that these are not experimental data, these are modeled on the basis of um, uh, you know, the, doing the deletion mutant that is that which lacks four amino acids. That's the best you can model with the closed. So there's the substrate. Uh, obviously, that lid isn't very closed. You can see lots of it. And here it is uh, according to the open structure. And that's totally open, of course. So th I don't think there's any doubt that moving those four amino acids, removing those four amino acids, uh, will, will have um, uh, eliminated the possibility of the enzyme lid, if it is one, closing. So how does that enzyme behave? Well, first, the wild type. Um, what we're testing, remember, is I'm going to go do these experiments downhill, so right to left. Start with glyceraldehyde phosphate and ask, how often does an enediol fall off and decompose? Well, with the wild type, with the ordinary enzyme, <coughs> you can't measure it. <laughs> it's so rare. But what you can do is put a, an upper limit. So less than one in 10 to the 5 molecules ever falls off. So you would say, this enzyme is pretty clever. It doesn't let that happen. Uh, the, the normal enzyme makes absolutely sure that anything that's bound gets all the way through. So the throughput is very high indeed. Nothing falls off. I mean, almost nothing. Undetectable amounts fall off. What about our mutant that just lacks those four amino acids? That's all it lacks. It's, otherwise, it's lovely. This is a pathetic enzyme. <laughs> In fact, it's almost a destructive enzyme. You add very nice substrate. And what happens is that out of six molecules, five fall off and decompose. <laughs> and only one gets through to the other side to make dihydroxyacetone phosphate. Um, and you can see this, this dramatic change of, I mean, more than 10 to the 5 in uh, throughput efficiency uh, makes one believe that this is part of the machine that this is a necessary part uh, of the machine. And that I, I, I'm purposely, towards the end of this lecture, I wanted to 
lead you away from curly arrow pushing, mere just curly, pushing curly arrows and saying, okay, I explain it, that's chemistry, I'm a physical organic chemist, I can, I can explain everything. I want, you, I want to seduce you towards think, imagining, to realizing that there may be changes in the shape of the molecule and, and that it's become almost, a, yes, I used the word a second ago, a catalytic machine and that there are f what we might call physical rather than mere chemical features to catalysis when you want catalysis to be as dramatic uh, as enzymes so often are. So here we have uh, this example uh, and I've here raised and slightly answered uh, a question that you might have had, I hope you have had, from time to time in the back of your minds. Why are enzymes so big? You know, here is triosphosphate isomerase. The monomer is 25,000 molecular weight just for messing about with a couple of protons uh, in a substrate that is more um, molecular weight 150 or something, I don't know, 180. Um, you know, why do I need 25,000? Well, I hope that today you might have begun to see why that might be. I mean, what we've just discovered, I've said loops and levers, but that's for other bits of enzymology. We've just seen a lid, or what you might call it a loop. But, and the function of that, we believe, of course, from what I've told you, is that that sequestration of the intermediate, in diol, keeping it safe from uh, decomposition, from escape and decomposition. We've seen that, whoops, we can't spell either. Uh, <laughs> um, forgive me. Um, the positioning of catalytic groups, if you want to be s that snug and that accurate, then you know, you're not just a bond. What's the carbon-carbon bond length? 1.54, would you give me, angstroms? Um, that's much too crude. You may want to, that glutamate, that glutamic acid, the yellow one, was snuggling against the substrate to within perhaps 0.1 of an angstrom. So you, you need lots more fine adjustments over here. You want a bond there that will change um, and have a, a much more precise and fine-tuned effect. Uh, uh, at, you want sort of a micrometer arrangement, and that, may, that also will need a much larger molecule. And you uh, want both, as I've said here, precision of distance and of where it's pointing, of orientation. And then, of course, if I'm going to start having great gun barrels, um, alpha helices, um, then uh, and then, of course, you need a much bigger molecule because you've got to have something to support the end of the gun, so that the end of the barrel, so it points appropriately. And the aim of those helices becomes important. And we've seen, actually, in this example, two, um, two uh, helices. And so, on my final slide, uh, there is a picture of Tim, of triosphosphate isomerase, and all I've done uh, in, answer, in, in looking at and trying to accommodate the, the uh, answer to the question of why an enzyme is so big is to put for you, to show you both the helix that looks at phosphate, and you see that comes jolly nearly to the edge of the molecule, and that if I, and I need all this stuff here, in order to secure that end so it aims absolutely correctly and accurately to that phosphate. Analogously here, I want the histidine here, then you see it, that, that if, I want, if I'm going to demand a functional helix that's going to affect the pKa of that uh, histidine uh, in the way we think now it does, then you see I've already got a molecule at least that in diameter. Never mind the fact that if I want a lid on the whole thing to avoid losing the intermediate, then you can see the ends, the hinges, if you will, of that lid um, are 
ah, that one at least, is near the edge of the molecule. So I hope you can see that at this level at least of analysis and thinking, the enzyme, uh, an enzyme, you would not expect an enzyme to be very, very small. Indeed, the smallest enzymes <coughs> routinely would be, we would say, 12,000, 13, 13,000. I mean, early ones, lysozyme is about, which was the first enzyme to have its crystal structure determined, is 14,000. Ribonuclease is 14,000. This is 25, so it's you know, nearly twice the size, but it's doing a, I would submit, a much more superior job um, <laughs> than those. Finally, um, I'm going to acknowledge um, a large number of people, because we worked on this problem, but there's only one in red. <laughs> um, um, there, I, we got interested in this you know, before anybody was born in this room except me. Um, and uh, we became interested, but over the years, very different aspects I've only talked to in these last two lectures, I, all kinds of things I didn't mention, um, Professor Combs's work at all. Critical, exquisite, she'll tell you about it. <laughs> exquisite <No>. use, <laughs> well, I will then, <laughs> of, of infrared, uh, infrared spectroscopy to, to say, is that carbonyl group perturbed? Is it polarized? Is there strain in Tim towards the transition state to, uh, to help lower the transition state? She will tell you about it because you'll ask her and she'll have to answer. <laughs> um, and in here are some people, some very distinguished uh, uh, people like Wally Gilbert um, and uh, crystallography and, and uh, crystallographers and collaborators, faculty collaborators, but people who, who did all kinds of work. But I have, of course, uh, right in the middle there, um, is the only really important person, um, uh, and thank you. <laughs> okay. Shut up. We do have a little bit of time. Does anybody want to ask Jeremy some philosophical questions? Or <laughs> okay, so I have a question. Um, I wonder if you investigated at all how the lid moves, like what prompts it to close and open again to let the product out. Ah. Oh, what a penet what a lovely question. Have have we have we done anything about how the lid moves? The answer is no, because I fell off a train. Uh I was hit by a truck uh in nineteen ninety one uh and um uh um stopped closed my research group. But Anne um McDermott uh in um Columbia in the nineties did some lovely work on that loop movement. She put in a tryptophan as a sort of, um, hi, um, a, a fluorescent um, probe. Uh, Betsy, you all know this work better than I. And showed that got by, um, how did she get? NMR? No. I think it was fluorine NMR, but I, I'll have to. It must have been a fluorotyrosine, yeah, a fluoro fluorotryptophan. fluorotryptophan. Anyway. Um, Professor McDermott and McDermott at Columbia uh, studied the, the rate of opening and closing of the, um, of the loop very wisely and just as well uh, because uh, she showed that it, it's, it's very fast, fast and constant. And it, it isn't, as it were, uh, triggered, right? It's, you don't have to imagine, well, how does the enzyme know that there's a substrate waiting to get in, <laughs> um, uh, which is the, under uh, uh, the, the subtext of your question, I think, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a lovely question because we've got always to worry, not to be anthropomorphic, not to say, that is, that the enzyme thinks. No, enzymes don't think. Uh, or the enzyme knows. No, 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 they're not <laughs> conscious. Uh, items, um, and therefore we have to understand how the enzyme might be designed so that um, uh, uh, it simply works. And in this case, uh, Anne McDermott has shown that it, it um, that the loop opening and closing is is fast. I presume that what we're really seeing is that its opening and closing is very fast. But once something binds, is this? 
um, then of course it has to be closed. But you don't see that because the chemistry is not rate limiting. Uh, yeah, no, that's very okay, yes. <laughs> so that, so that... By the time it opens again, product is already the, made. The product's already made, yes. So, I mean, what that says in another way is that your chemistry has to be very fast. Otherwise, it would open at the wrong moment mm -hmm. and let out the precious in dial. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, so that would be uh, uh, more things. We don't need this rubbish up here um, on the, um, on the um, energy profile. Any other questions? You all happy? Yes. <laughs> What's my email? Do you know my name? <laughs> um, then all you have to do is to put an underscore between Jeremy and Knowles and then at harvard.edu. Okay. Okay. Um, and I forgot to say one thing, and that's this. We, we put that one on the web. So oh, did you? One. Okay. That was the... Um, uh, that has lots of the colored pictures that you saw here um, uh, and some of the thinking. You sure you're happy? All right. Let's thank Professor. Be sure.